Hi everyone, I am Karthika Kamath and welcome to my channel Brainverse Talks. For today's video, I have chosen this topic, Network Dilution and Asymmetry in an Efficient Brain. This is actually a research paper that I recently came across and I found it very interesting. The title of this research paper is Network Dilution and Asymmetry in an Efficient Brain. There are a lot of terms in this title itself that need more explanation. So I'll deal with that first. But wait till the end of the video because there is some interesting bit that is coming out of this paper that I want to share with you all. So let's get started. Let me discuss network dilution with you all first. On the screen, you can see a very simple neural network with two neurons in the input layer and four neurons in the subsequent layer. This neuron is connected to only two of them in the next layer and this neuron is connected to three of them. But if it was connected to all of them, like both of them are connected to all the neurons in the next layer, then we would have called it a fully connected network. And in that case, this dilution factor, which is denoted by the symbol rho, would have been equal to zero. That is, it is 0% diluted. But in this case, how do we calculate rho? It's actually a ratio, where in the denominator, we will have all possible connections that are possible in this network, which is this neuron can be connected to 4, and this can also be connected to 4. So both this 4 is equal to 8. That takes the denominator value. And in the numerator, we'll have the number of connections that are missing. In this case, this neuron is not connected to 2 of them, and this neuron is not connected to 1. So 2 plus 1 is 3. So 3 is in the neuron numerator. And rho here will be equal to 3 by 8. Next, we have asymmetry, which is denoted by the symbol epsilon. In this case, you have the two neurons that are connected with each other with an equal amount of strength or weight. And that's why we call it symmetric in nature. And in this case, epsilon will be equal to zero. In all other cases, epsilon will be equal to one and will have an asymmetric kind of a situation. Like over here, we have the two neurons, although they are connected to each other, but they are connected with different strength or different weights. So it's still asymmetric in nature. Finally, we have efficient brain. In this context, the efficiency of the brain is given by these three factors. First, memory capacity. That is the storage capacity of your brain. Second, association speed. That is the time it takes to connect the input stimulus to a particular stored memory in your brain. Third is energy consumption. That is the amount of energy that is consumed to make this kind of an association. Before I jump into the crux of this paper, let me discuss a few more things with you. First, what is a recurrent neural network? A recurrent neural network is a special type of an artificial neural network. So not just the input, it also has a feedback. So feedback is the new addition from what we generally know of an artificial neural network, right? So what this feedback does is that in RNNs, they introduce a concept of memory that helps them store the states or information of previous inputs to generate the next output of the sequence. So you can visualize it better if you unfold this particular segment and after unfolding, you get something like this. So there is an input and the output calculated at this stage is fed into the next layer and the output is again fed to the next. So basically, along with the input that it's getting at every stage, it's also getting the output from the previous stage. And both of that is taken together to calculate the final output at this particular stage, which is then again fed to the next stage. Next, we have Hopfield network. A Hopfield network is a special type of RNN that is single layer, as you can see on the screen, and in which the neurons are entirely connected. That is, each neuron is associated with other neurons. This was introduced in 1982 by John Hopfield in order to demonstrate the memory collection and retrieval in the human brain. In this paper, a discrete time recurrent neural network 
composed of meclopid neuron is used for the modeling purpose. So what is a meclopid neuron? You can see on the screen that this neuron processes information something like this. So it gets multiple inputs and each input is associated with a certain weight. It first does a weighted sum and after that it checks it alongside a particular threshold. So if the sum is greater than that threshold then the output return is 1 otherwise it is 0. Like the neuron that you saw in the previous slide uh, like that, multiple such neurons can be interconnected to form the recurrent neural network and that is what is used in this paper. So to study the dynamics of this paper, uh, this model, uh, you can use this discrete time difference equation. And here you can see Jij is nothing but the connectivity matrix and that represents the stored connections. That is stored connections or the weights that I was talking about. Uh, from J, Jth neuron to Ith neuron and then sigma of J, sigma J of P is the state of the Jth neuron at time P and there are two states possible here. It's a binary uh, variable uh, which is 0 can be resting state and 1 is the firing state. So there's a weighted sum that happens over here from J equal to 1 to N that is all the neurons uh, that are coming to the neuron i, uh, that is possibly n is the dimension here. So let's say there are n neurons. Remember the Hopf field network? So there are n neurons that are interconnected to each other. So if you take one particular neuron, then there are n minus 1 connections coming to it, towards it. So all of that is taken in a weighted sum format and then that is compared to the threshold which is eta. If it is greater than the threshold then you have a value of 1 that is basically that particular neuron is going to be fired at the next time instance otherwise it's going to be in the resting state with a value of 0. Quickly touching upon the method that is followed in this paper to arrive at the results uh, right now so um, what they've done is they have taken different combinations of asymmetry and dilution values for a neural network or a Hopf field network which is a type of a recurrent neural network and it has um, they've used the neurons that is the meclopid uh, neurons and they've already just discussed the discrete time dis difference equation that tells the dynamics of this kind of a network so they've taken this kind of a network with a dimension of n equal to 6 so when n is equal to 6, that means there are 6 neurons and each neuron can either be in the state 0 or 1. So the total number of possible states can be 2 to the power 6, which is 64 states. So what they've done is with different asymmetry and dilution values along with the different randomly assigned Jij values, that is Jij is the connectivity matrix, that is a weight associated with one neuron to the other neuron connection. So they've taken this and they have done some sort of a simulation and with different input states. So there are there are 64 input states possible and with different input states, they are observing how the dynamics change, like how uh, the values change from this T time point to T plus one time point. And uh, this is what they are observed. This is for one particular scenario. This is just an example here on the screen. The circles are the starting state. The triangles are called the transient state. That is, that state is, um, uh, that, that state is achieved only once from a particular starting state. And then the, the squares are the limit cycle or the stable state actually. So if there is only one stable state, then we call it a fixed point, like in this scenario or this scenario. If there are multiple stable states, then we call it a limit cycle of that particular number of things. Like for example, here there are three. So it has a limit cycle of three. Here it has a limit cycle of four. So, um, and they have, you, you can see your clusters that are formed, right? So for all these different kind of Starting states, 
they follow a similar pattern and end at this particular stable state. So based on that, they have formed different clusters and you can see a total of four different limit cycles are possible. So C equal to four, which is also called as the number of attractors that are possible in this particular simulation or this particular configuration. So uh, there are four attractors possible and um, and you can see in each cluster, there are different number of new uh, states that are possible are uh, 1, 19, 24, and 20. So this is just a example. And they have done this kind of a simulation for different combinations of dilution and asymmetry values, along with different randomly assigned connectivity matrix. And they have come at a result. So now we'll proceed and talk about the result, which is the exciting part. Let's now talk about the result. The first observation is regarding memory capacity. So memory capacity, just to recall, is the number of stored information that is possible in a network. So in terms of the simulation that we saw, that is the number of attractors that are possible in the simulation or in that particular configuration. So um, here we can see a graph that is memory capacity as a function of the network dilution row for n equal to 12, which is this lower one and the upper one is n equal to eight neurons network for a asymmetric network. So epsilon equal to one is taken over here, whereas the row values are varied from zero to one. So you can see somewhere around 0 0.9 is where we find a sudden increase in memory capacity for both the n equal to 12 and n equal to 18. So the surprising part here is this 0.9% dilution is what is observed in the nature that is in mammalian cortex and hippocampus as well. So now we know why it is so in nature because at 0.9% dilution is what the optimum value or, or the memory capacity is achieved for a given configuration of neural network. So it's not like uh, all the neurons are connected towards each other and everything. So in that scenario, yes, it is good. We might have good memory capacity, but Nature tries to optimize things and 0.9% dilution value it has found works great for it. So you can see in this small graph here, the blue one is the asymmetric 0.9% dilution scenario and the green one is the hop field network that is fully connected symmetric network. So yes, both blue and green, we find it's having a similar kind of, uh, you know, nature that is basically uh, it is increased with increased number, increasing our dimension. We are having an increase in the capacity of memory, but um, the blue one is still better and it's an optimal way compared to all the neurons being connected towards each other. The second observation is regarding the association time, which is the time required to go from uh, input stimuli or an input state to a steady state. So in terms of the simulation that we saw, what we mean here is that from an input state, the number of transient states that it goes through to finally arrive at the stable state or the attractor. So that is the association time. And again, for an asymmetric network with different row or the dilution values association time is compared and you can see with increasing row the association time is decreasing so again somewhere like 0 0.9 is a good optimum value for low association time and along with higher memory capacity the final observation is on energy so in this smaller graph, the below graph, you can see with increasing dimension, the energy cost associated for the three different configurations. The green one is the hop field network that is fully connected and symmetric. The blue one is the one we have been talking about, which is symmetric. Sorry, the yellow one is what we have been talking about. The blue one is symmetric and 0.9% dilution. The yellow one is asymmetric and 0.9% dilution. So we can see here clearly that the yellow one has the least energy 
irrespective of whatever dimension it is, it is going to have the least energy cost associated. Whereas the green one has the maximum. So here is the difference. So just tying it up with the first observation on memory capacity, where we had seen that the Hawk field works as good as uh, the asymmetric 0.9% dilution. But in this scenario, we see that why does that does not happen in nature? Because if we have a fully connected neural network, then the energy cost associated will be more. Whereas if you take asymmetric 0.9% dilution kind of a configuration, then the energy cost associated will be less. Along with having a good memory capacity as well as memory retrieval or the association time. Just to complete this, I'll quickly tell what energy cost or how is that measured in the simulation. So, you know, the states that can be obtained for each neuron is either zero or one. So in a stable state, if it has maximum number of ones, that is, it is in firing state, then the energy used is four. So ideally what we need is in a stable state, there should be maximum number of zeros. So that defines the energy. For this, we have come towards the end of the video. I hope you liked it and you learned something new here. So please like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you with some new topic the next time. And also do not forget if you want to read in depth about this paper, then I am going to put the citation in the description below. Thank you.